Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the Curator of Public Programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. The Fowler is very pleased to present today's program as part of our World Arts Local Lives digital programs. Today's program is part of our Share the Mic series. The Fowler believes in the civic duty of museums to give forum to different points of view and is committed to amplifying the voices of Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized peoples. This series offers a platform to thought leaders, artists, activists, and allies who are guiding us along the arc of justice. Today, we will be discussing incarcerated arts with the inspirational leaders of art programs for imprisoned people. Art programs for incarcerated youth and adults provide healing informed strategies for coping with trauma and significant challenges of re-entering society. These programs empower the imprisoned to break generational cycles and reclaim their individual narratives. They also provide opportunities for those outside prison walls to see the value and creative potential of all human beings. Today, we will explore how museums and other cultural and academic institutions can destigmatize and center incarcerated voices in the public sphere and elevate all forms of experience and knowledge. With days left before the November election, the panel will conclude with a spoken word performance by Tobias Tubbs titled, When I'm President. Our panelists today include Bidon Roy, co-founder of Words Uncaged and faculty director of CSULA's Bachelor of Arts program at Lancaster State Prison. Tobias Tubbs, spoken word artist and co-founder of Words Uncaged. Fabian Debora, Executive Director of Somos La Arte, Homeboy Art Academy, and Johanna Blunt, Program Director of Rhythm Arts Alliance. This conversation will be moderated by our own Amy Landau, Director of Education and Interpretation at the Fowler Museum. If you have any questions during this program, we encourage you to submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can upvote questions that you would most like to hear answered by program participants at the end of the program. Before we move into our conversation, we have a video to show you, offering a short look at the programs represented here today and the important work that they achieve. Like people look at me and they just assume like I'm a criminal, like I gang bang and stuff like that. But I mean, shit, but well, it's the truth. Redemption, I'm able to redeem myself. I learned about a little bit about my heritage, on my culture, my my background. I learned about where drums come from, what they're made of. When I, you're proud of who you are, it makes you behave better. And I've always been proud of who I am because it just made me prouder. It's so well done. Thanks. Like, it's honestly having put that much history so condensed into such a short of, like you did a really, really great job of it. Thank what are you right here? Thank you so much. Um, that's the thread for the day, and we're gonna do our love. I have more to myself that I'm gonna be able to share because that everyone goes through their bumps in their road. <laughs> I wrote this on February 9, 2018, and it starts off as Dear somebody who actually cares. My name is Kalani, I'm 15 years old, and I'm currently locked up in juvenile hall. I like juvenile hall because it helps me maintain and understand myself. However, there are a lot of things I think are unfair. It confuses me, really. How are we supposed to fix our lives when no one teaches us how to get our lives together? Many of us come from broken homes and don't have anyone to teach us. Then we get up, and once we are released, many of us have no, no one to really rely on and we come right back, creating an endless cycle. I hope whoever is reading this understands that being the system sucks, 
It's hard to really rehabilitate yourself when you're constantly slipping through the cracks made by society. Art. It has been the main foundation of what has kept me sane. It's the voice of my children, the voice of my loved ones, the voice of my father. For me, it's my inner voice. That's how I use it, as a vehicle to be able to speak for those who've been denied to be able to capture the beauty within my environment as well as the issues that take place within my community. Art saved my life. My name is Fabian Devora. I've been with Homeboy Industries 12 years, and today I am the Executive Director of the Homeboy Art Academy. Homeboy Art Academy is a space that I have developed in order to create access and provide healing and transformation via the arts. It's what they call an inevitable. The way the sun come around, the way the moon stick around until we done with it, have a little fun with it. At the Homeboy Art Academy, we provide various arts disciplines for healing and transformation. Music production visual arts, theater improv, creative writing, slash poetry. We come to learn through my own lived experience as a practitioner in the arts, that the arts serves as the vehicle and language as for us to take ownership of our own narratives in our communities. Like, can I forget about all the problems that I used to have? I could get used to that, needed more music, and now I got a surplus tour around the world with a crew and fed we the mouthpieces for the brown generation. Need dope from me, slow, we off the gold line station. This is all gold. My name is Javier Chavez. I've been with Homeboy seven years. Today I'm the art navigator for the Homeboy Art Academy. One thing that you bring out in me was my own personal youth. I saw me in these tables, not that I was ever in the art academy as a youth, because of course I came from a different era, but uh, just to see them, it made me relive my youth. It, it brought hope into the youth that's in me, the one that's been hurting in the past, you know? They brought out a man who cares. They brought sincereness out of me. They brought uh, feelings that I hadn't felt in a while. Uh, so they brought up a lot of different emotions, but they were all positive ones. This is all gold certified, homegrown, recorded so. All my fans and my fam got a piece of my soul. It is a responsibility for us to bridge the generational gap through multi generational art services. We have an extensive reach camps, juvenile halls, parks recreation centers as well as senior citizen through cultural knowledge cultural arts we are able to help folks re-identify and reconnect to their ancestral lineages in this way we can begin to preserve our story tell our story and take full ownership of our own stories and the arts serves as the proper tool for us to accomplish. They better know my role was to show that giving in has never been an easy choice. Think about all the things you did to get here. Words uncaged, words uncaged. Lights, camera, action, the whole world is a stage. These are words uncaged. Oh, my nickname is uh, CP1, Critical uh, Pedagogue 1. Uh, critical Pedagogy is a tool that uh, you brought to us that allows us to humanize ourselves and to be able to uh, shift 
minds and hearts uh, of people. The word pedagogy itself comes out of Plato's cave, that one youth or child prisoner, they said, that was locked up and was awakened by wisdom and it was released into society to be able to wake up the other youth. So uh, coming from that kind of premise that uh, we've taken that to the yard with the youth, letting them know that uh, they have a platform to speak and to feel and to recreate themselves. So uh, that was our initial uh, uh, implication of critical pedagogy. Uh, ultimately, uh, a group of men came together with a more pointed intention was to evolve ourselves into different programs, whether it was uh, the art room, bare bones, uh, the brothers up out of the 10P movement. Just, we're gonna get active about uh, our rehabilitation and seeking to give back something to society. So that's initially what it was. As it became a stronger movement, we start to energize space. We start to energize people, you know, and let them know that there is hope. It's alive, then it spread to our parents and our communities. Then we started working with Cal State University and those students, you know, and they chimed in with it. You know, then we started having various events in which pedagogy or look, there's a different way to look at incarceration. There's a different way to look at us. But it was fueled by us. You know, we had to believe in it. We had to have the vision. And uh, I was happy uh, to be a part of it uh, to, in the roles I've played so, so, thus far. A new literature course at Cal State LA is teaming up students with rescued dogs and prison inmates. Today, the 50 students got to meet the dogs they'll be writing about on the theme of imprisonment. The students are tasked with developing journal entries kept by prison inmates into works of literature. The inmates are participating in the Pause for Life training program where they'll work with the dogs and record their personal interactions and impressions. The students and the inmates are both going to be reading the same literature, having similar experiences with the dogs, and then um, corresponding uh, with each other about those. The dogs will live at the prison for 12 weeks. This is the first time the course is being offered. Hi, everyone. Um, we had a number of more people join us, so I want to welcome you all again to share the mic. I'm Amy Landau from the Fowler Museum. The aim of this series and today's program is, is to learn from and really enjoy different forms of knowledge, especially those that arise from lived experiences as was referred to in the videos. We designed this series, Share the Mic, specifically for the current moment when museums are really being asked, they're being called upon to one, share authority, be truthful in, rela in relating difficult histories and realities and cease privileging white and Eurocentric viewpoints. The Fowler Museum has had a history of creating spaces for artists and activists and audiences to grapple with social, with key social concerns. And today's conversation is a continuation of that tradition. And it's very much in this vein that we do this work. Today's discussion is about destigmatizing the art made by people who have experienced a range of emotions of feelings and the trauma of being incarcerated. So we as museum folks, we're really at our best when we explore what does it mean to be human? And just like our speakers, our work in the museum pivots around such themes as hope and forgiveness, liberation and power. So Johanna, Fabian, Tobias, and Vidan, I really want to thank you all for being here. I think what has captivated me most in our recent conversations is a combination of your kindness and your dedication and your talent. And all of this has freed me to come to a topic that I know relatively little about, but that I care a lot about. I really want our audiences, those with us today, to get to know you and have the opportunity that I'm having to get to know you. So just to start us off, I would like you to begin just saying a bit more about yourself. We heard about your organizations in the video, but tell us more about yourself, your personal story and what brought you to this work. And I'm gonna pass it to um, Tobias and Bidon. Uh, the co-founders of Worlds Uncaged. And I really do hope you tell us a little bit about how you met and your friendship, because that was really inspirational. 
Well, um, I'm, I'm glad you got to see the footage there that we filmed while Tobias was still incarcerated. When I met Tobias, he had a life without parole sentence, which means for those that don't know, my uh, incarceration sentence. And the uh, little clip you played of the dog program, initially um, I was involved with a dog program at Lancaster Prison, Pause for Life. I'm, I'm no longer involved with that, but um, that gave me the opportunity to meet Tobias. Tobias was a member of that program. And once I sort of started working in the prison in that program, um, I, I got sort of um, deeply connected to so many of the people in there. And I really felt for the plight of the men that were in there and particularly, you know, men like Tobias with life without parole. So it's, I'll let Tobias take it up, but it's a it's it's a real kind of special honor to have him here in, in my house with me doing this when you know we were just reflecting during that video, it was just a few years ago, you know, that he was sentenced to die in prison. So um yeah. Tobias. Hello everyone, my name is uh Tobias Tubbs. As uh Bavon has said, in 1991, still an adolescent, uh without uh you know, ever shooting a gun at anyone without a fight ever in my life. I was sentenced to die, literally, uh, through the sentence of life without the possibility of parole. No gang affiliation, never been into jail before. And uh, I guess that will underpin uh, my story and the plight uh, for me to fight for my freedom. So after, uh, I say, about 25 years of some of the worst institutions, dealing with inhumanity uh, on very, I guess, despicable levels, just the conditions of the way we were treated. Uh, but I chose to, to love, I chose to hug, I chose to smile, I chose to create spaces uh, for ancestral connection, for, for, for spirituality of all kinds to flourish. And that's what I became known for. That led me to Lancaster uh, in 2012 in which, uh, yes, he said the dog program, but what made the dog program so special, I was called the pooper scooper. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And it was a very humbling experience of one of my reputation in the system. Uh, 33 prisons, my name carried uh, its weight, but I humbled myself to picking up that poop and I loved it. Uh, and it led me to meeting Bavon. And uh, I will close with this. And one day me and him was walking and he said, we have to create an organization that will get platform to your light and the light of men and women like yourself. And we, did, uh, we created that, Words on Cage. And, uh, and here we are, uh, happy to uh, you know, be a part today. Yeah. I remember you saying one thing in, in conversation that made my hair stand on end. Mm. And that was when you said that you recognize aspects of one another. So right. the professor became the prisoner. And like, Right. Being at a university museum and being as I recognize that, that spoke truth to me. And can you take us through that? Oh, yes. Uh, as me and Bavon started uh, speaking, it was so much that we have done. Like he's lived on the now. I've traveled the now, but through the vicissitudes of my imagination. You know, so as we was like just vibing and talking, I noticed that he felt imprisoned by a system that did not allow his wings to flourish. And then, so I'm saying there is a prison within the, or a prisoner within the professor, and there is a professor within every prisoner. And not only a professor, but a director, but a president, but a, a leader, whatever the case might be. So often we have to change those roles. Professors have to be quiet. Those of us with live experience have to be able to get the platforms to speak. So when we say uh, the, uh, the professor and the prisoner, it's just the changing of the roles. Cause one would think that he's freeing me and it turned out I was freeing him, thus we help free each other. Mm, really beautiful. Thanks for sharing Thank that. And Johanna, you're a you're a Bruin. You're yes. from UCLA. Can you I did? Yes. yes, I went to UCLA. I was in uh, the School of Theater, Film and Television. So <laughs> I was a, a theater major and um I actually haven't acted since I graduated. <laughs> 
Um, but definitely have been working in the arts though. My life took a, a, a different turn um, since I graduated. But um, the way that I got involved uh, in this type of work, well, I do have family members who have been incarcerated and who are currently incarcerated. So I have had exposure to that um, just through you know, uh, family experiences. But my life trajectory really changed the first time that I set foot into a juvenile detention center with children in it. I was fairly young. I was like, um, I, I think I was still in my early, early 20s. And so the kids that were in the facility were not far from my age. Like they could have been my siblings or, you know, um, really closely uh, related to me. And when I would uh, speak to them and hear the circumstances they were put in, it just really gave me such a different perspective on what's going on. And um, I also grew up with cultural arts very prevalent in my household. It gave me such an appreciation for my parents and what they exposed us to. But I realized that I had been um, very privileged growing up, not just because of a financial standing or a social status, but because I had art, I had uh, I had a release, I had some place to channel my energy, my anger, whatever I was feeling, my joy. I had a way to to release it, and I knew when I went into a juvenile detention center that those kids, like I I have a responsibility to share this cultural art form with my brothers and sisters who have not discovered it yet. And, um, and that's pretty much where we're at today. Uh, I just really, I really think it's important that they have some kind of, uh, of a channel, you know, mm -hmm. for their circumstances. Cause a lot of them are, are just in really terrible circumstances you know, and um, they're not bad the way the society portrays them to be. And, um, and I think cultural arts is definitely a way, it's not to fix any problem. It doesn't really, you know, create any solution for what's going on. That's like lawmakers and whatnot. They need to fix this mess, but it provides some coping. Uh, you know, it provides just a way to get, move on to the next day or to, it's, it's therapy. It's a way to be seen, a way to be heard, yeah. at least in the juvenile centers that I, I work in. Yeah, so. I know you're definitely an inspiration to a lot of students at UCLA um, mm -hmm. who, you know, showing a model of how you use your art for social justice causes. And I just wanna call out Bruin Underground Scholars who are in the audience with us today. And there are a group of students who support academic experiences of other students who identify as formerly incarcerated or system impacted. So a call out to them and thank you for being here. Um, Fabian, yes. so in that video, we didn't hear much about all your murals around Los Angeles. And so take us yeah. through some of the art practice. Man, I think for me, um, yeah, as, as Johanna mentioned, you know, it's, it's more than just the arts, it's, it's become a responsibility. And I think for me, uh, in knowing that I partook in the cycle of violence uh, due to the obstacle number one that was in place at a very young age, which was immigration. Both my parents were immigrants and having to deal with the disparities, the lack of access, lack of opportunities, it somehow uh, impacted my innocence and I cannot foresee a future so I then fell into the chains of this cycle of violence, which led me to joining gangs at a very young age, at the age of 12. Although in between all this pain and abuse and neglect and abandonment and all this trauma, I discovered one thing, and I was blessed with this thing, which was the gift of art. And this gift, I was able then to embrace and, and, and make it my big brother, where I can create my own worlds to escape my reality. That was the initiation of knowing that I do have this gift. And so even though I went in and out of incarceration throughout my trajectory for 15 years of, 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 of this lost in this revolving door, I knew I had this gift. And it just took resources and people to really acknowledge me for this talent, this gift, and see me for me without these obstacles that were in place already for my family to really think about that there may be a better way. 
So eventually I came to Homeboy Industries in 2007 to redirect my life. And there is when I started to recognize uh, the importance of healing and transformation, not only through the, uh, I call them non-traditional because uh, we always get caught up with this non-traditional art practice, but no, I'm here to say these are traditional arts practices. What's non-traditional is the mental health and the substance abuse services that they provide. If we, but that's another story, but I just wanna make that clear. Because of the traditional arts practices that were introduced to me and my ancestral lineages there, I was able to then feel my heartbeat. And I say, wow, this is what was taken from me. Mm -hmm. Then how do then I take my own lived experience, everything that I've been exposed to through my ancestors and also those elders that still reside in this land to be able to then bring forth to the youth and the adults in incarceration so they too can feel that heartbeat. And, and through the conversations, through the language, through the connections, and through the introductions of traditional arts, we can make that happen. So for me, and knowing that I, I'm grounded in Boyle Heights in East LA, there's still a, a lot of work ahead of us. And these platforms need to continue to happen and, can, and, and so that this way we actually can support us as we are trying to create these pathways for system involved, gang involved youth, young men and women. I'll mm -hmm. leave it at that because I know time is ticking and we can get more into the dialogue about that. No, it's all good. Yeah. So I wanna talk about the platforms and then go back to what seems to be a theme, which is like representation and identity, both created and what people give and stigma. But in terms of platforms, I wanted to go a little bit in greater detail and talk about like, how much time and support, and by support, I mean supplies and funding, are afforded to creative arts programs that are partnering with prisons and correctional facilities like juvenile detention centers? How much support is given? Like, how does it all break down? So I'm curious, when you have this partnership, what does it look like on the ground? How many classes are they offered weekly? Are they offered monthly? Are there opportunities for those who, those people who are incarcerated to exhibit their art outside the prison? Um, and do you ever have a scenario where people are commissioning artwork from those inside? And I just leave it open to the group. Well, um, I'll, I can start on that. So um, it's very difficult to do any kind of programs with the prison system, the adult prison system. Um, there, as you might imagine, there's a lot of restrictions because I suppose if I try and think about it from the CO's perspective, how they see it is if nothing happens ever, they've done their job. So to actually do something is almost counter to um, the culture, or not almost, it is counter to, to the culture of the prison. So getting the art in and out of a prison or getting it out of a prison is a very challenging um, thing to do. Um, we've had a lot of exhibits, but it's not easy getting art out of a prison. It's not easy for men to have a space to create art in prison. It depends on which prison you're talking about. Lancaster, where we have a lot of programs, has an art room. But Calipatria, where we also do work, has nothing. So it, it varies a lot on the prison. Um, and then there's, beyond that, I think, and Bias and Fabian can speak to this more, but there's a kind of culture of um, not necessarily wanting people in prison to be able to express themselves through art and to get recognition for it. I mean, the, the thing that kind of moved me most when I first went into prison was, was, was who these men were. And you see this kind of, this light in them and this, this um, spirit and this that really is caged in so many ways and so art is a way and literature is a way of allowing that into the world and and that is a fundamentally kind of politically destabilizing act to see these people as human beings capable of producing beautiful art because then you can't think of them as objects that you can then throw away and and, and leave and forget about. And, and one thing um, that is also at times difficult is because, you know, for uh, us speaking on behalf of the Mexican American population within the institution, um, they have stigmatized our culture. 
And when, when I, when, what I mean by that is when we try to bring forth these uh, traditional arts practices in conjunction with the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Incas, the hieroglyphics have been made to be identified toward that of the Mexican mafia. And that in itself, it's very difficult for us to even redefine those symbolic imageries that have been cultivated by my ancestors because of the mindsets of the prison and the COs and those wardens to think that everything that they create in resemblance of our Aztecs and Mayans has to do with hidden messaging, which I get it, it has happened in the past. But if we're talking about rehabilitation, when do we get the leverage to then bring that back in and help folks redefine and reclaim the true definition of these hieroglyphics and uh, traditional imageries that have been created for centuries? And so that in itself keeps us also from really trying to make that connection. And, but we keep working it and we keep pushing it. But I think that it's not only about rehabilitation. I think uh, it's about uh, transformation, but transformation of the whole institution as a whole, right? And also, uh, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what I, I bring for it. But the, but, the, but the participants that we bring this towards, you can see it, as they have mentioned here, you can see their light bulbs go up and they really feel, uh, they feel their worth in the moment and the time being. And I wish we can be there even longer, but as you asked the question, just for Tehachapi State Prison, due to ACTA, Alliance of California Traditional Arts, we're there 12 weeks for eight hours and, and, and we get them to a place and then we gotta wait for the next session. So I wish we can be there more consecutively. It will probably help even better. Yeah, I would say that in my own, in my personal experience, um, working in the juvenile centers, when you ask how much money or funding or resources are put into them, what I've seen is mostly that there are nonprofits that are, are going in, you know, there is some funding, there's some grants that, that is put into it, still not a lot, but um, I, there, so we know that there's like an obscene amount of budget set aside for corrections in this country. And to the point that like a lot of it doesn't even get used, right? This is a fact, like there's some budget that they need to find what to do with it. And I feel like that, is where this budget should be coming from, like from the government, because there's not an acknowledgement, number one, that, that art is, is healing, right? In this society in general, art is not respected the way that it should be. But number two, mental health is not paid attention to. Now we are starting to wake up. We are, we are starting to recognize and pay attention to mental health as um, part of, a, a, as a rehabilitative factor, you know, for, for incarcerated people. But um, we don't, acknowledge how much mental health and art are connected and how much that can really help in rehabilitating people who, 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 who need this. So to answer your question, I don't think there's a lot of funding or resources put into populations, um, into incarcerated um, um, people and, and populations. Um, I think there, there are some groups like our own you know, who are, are fighting, who are really on the ground, really trying to do this work, but it needs to come from more uh, higher up institutions and, uh, you know, the government. <laughs> Wherever there is funding for, uh, for corrections, some of that funding needs to be in, in, in tools that actually are rehabilitative for, for youth and for adults who are incarcerated. We so need to remember, uh-huh. So do you think it's a, a breakdown in communication about deploying the funds or do you think it's a hesitancy to use? No, I think it is by design. <laughs> I don't think there's no breakdown in communication. It's on purpose. <laughs> and there's a lot of people who are not aware. And so we need to start by spreading awareness because when people speak, that's when change happens, right? But mm -hmm. when we keep people ignorant, then we can keep on, you know, continuing these systems and these things that are really destructive and that are only benefiting a tiny, tiny percentage of people. Yeah. And, go ahead, Tobias, go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to share that I've been real fortunate in two years I've been out to talk to the governor's office, the mayor's office, I'm a part of the supervisors, Army Congress, and we had to make it clear, and they have agreed, the system is not broken. It's working as planned and designed. So yeah. once we can just grasp that off the top, it's not broken. Uh, they created for a lucrative business to be on the backs of Black 
and brown males and now women and children. When I came into the system, you're not human, so it's nothing sacred about you. So if there's nothing sacred about you, there's nothing to be honored, there's nothing to be praised, you're here to be punished. So prisons were designed for punishment, not for art rooms, not for choir, not for singing, not for dancing, not for having a good time. It was a revolutionary notion for me to smile in prison. There's a revolutionary notion being disruptive on the yard because I was bold enough to hug in prison. So when you talk about funding, there is a narrative that is in play and still in play that funds mass incarceration, uh, uh, punitive uh, kinds of thinking, uh, us against them, fear mongering. And this is one of the main reasons why art rooms or the arts do not flourish in our schools nor inside of our prison, uh, prison settings. I came into the system as an adolescent. I just had my 50th birthday just a week ago. Think about that, 30 years. The first 25 years, there was very little to no funding when it came to arts, anything culturally relevant, culturally sensitive, anything that identified with me as a black man with a history past slavery or having a homeland that was, it was none of that. So what we did from first day, 1991, until our good brother that we highlight amongst many others is an artist named Kenneth Webb. He went into the system at 16 years old through all kinds of pains and atrocities in which my brother Fabian spoke on that was in his community. Now this young man finds his, his voice. He finds his light, his redemption, his offering to humanity through his artwork. And what is so beautiful about that art room you know, CEOs, governors, and everyone else have benefited greatly from the art of incarcerated artists. You know, so it's just time for us to put uh, our voice and our bodies uh, to motion. And another thing too is restitution. You know, uh, we're paying uh, outlandish. You got men who are impoverished for the first part, or young men whose mothers and grandmothers and girlfriends for the most part are taking care of them out there incarcerated stay, paying tens of thousands in restitution and monies that do not go back into the communities because as for black and brown people, we don't harm white people. 99% of the crimes that we commit is against our own selves. So the hundreds of millions that are taken in restitutions go back into the system, not back into our communities in which uh, the arts and spirituality and connecting with our ancestries can be. We call this a word on cage, flipping the script. There was a narrative, we're going to reimagine a different narrative and not alone, we're not going to sit around waiting and begging people to fund it, we're just going to get to it. So yeah. I just want to add that to the conversation. Yeah, I love, so like taking on that word that's so defining this time about reimagining. I want to yeah. flip the question from what's happening now to reimagining what could happen in the future. Like mm. if taking the arts into these incarcerated communities? What would that look like? And this is open to everyone. Like, what would you want to see happen and why? Well, well, I mean, it all depends, right? You have different levels of, uh, like you have level one, two, three, and four. If I was speaking on behalf of my level four lifers, I mean, I would like for them to gain more leverage and more privileges and opportunities to be able to fulfill uh, the enrichment that comes from within their spirit by providing them uh, more access to even hobby cards. I mean, we can't even give them um, various art supplies because immediately they're made into weapons, which is to me, part of the sabotage that comes from the mindsets of the CEOs. Because believe me, when, when we talk about weapons, they don't need our pencils. They don't need our rulers. <laughs> they already, <laughs> they, they even tell me that. They're like, we don't need that, man. We got bigger than that, you know, but. That, that mindset of sabotage and, and punishment, even when we walk through these gates, you know, knowing that I have a background, I mean, I also feel like I'm walking on eggshells being prejudged already, walking in thinking if I may be bringing in something to the institution. I have to double check my pockets like 20 times, make sure that as paranoia, I'm, I'm traumatized, PTSD, because the last thing I want is not to get to the 
presence of those lifers. That's my job is to get in there. So I humble myself. I, I, I do whatever it takes. I don't push back too much just to get to the presence of the lifers. So what I would like to see is more buying from the institutions and more leverage given and not to live in such paranoia and old mindsets that these guys are out to get somebody when they're all they're trying to do is really reconnect, re-identify and be productive members of their communities. Most importantly, be those fathers to their daughters it, as much stories that I hear about coming out of that space. How do we then create that platform for that to take place without having sabotage in the middle? I think that um, my ideal situation, well, I have to say this, um, that there's, and we're kind of starting to be on our way to this anyway, that for youth at least, there should be no detention centers, period. They should not be locked up. Um, there definitely does need to be um, some, some help. There need to be centers where youth can go to rehabilitate and um, work, work out whatever it is that they need to work out. But I don't think that they should be incarcerated. Um, once you get to adult, that's, you know, that's a different situation. But the ideal, what I would like to see is methods and tactics that actually work, you know, that help to heal people. I would like to see that being implemented in these centers. And we all know, like, we have to face the uncomfortable truth that prisons are not meant to rehabilitate anyone. It's not meant to help anybody become a better person, period. They are modern day slave plantations, according to our United States Constitution. That is a fact. And we need to acknowledge that. And so once we acknowledge that prisons are not, had never have been meant to help anyone who is in that population, then we can start to talk about, okay, what do we actually do to help someone that is on a, a dark path? What methods, what tactics, what healing factors can we implement into their lives for actual you know, betterment of these people to contribute positive uh, impacts on society, you know, to be a positive part of society. But um, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see prisons in, in general, they don't work for whatever they're trying to tell us that they work for. They work for what they're meant for, and that's for profit, you know? But um, as far as the art that's created in prisons, we, we need to, um, we really need to give a platform for, for that art. like treat them as people with experiences, with emotions to be expressed, you know, on whatever medium they choose and expose it, share it, use the platform that you have. Um, we just have such a stigma about um, incarcerated people that all their rights are taken away. You know, they can't vote, they can't, they're not even, they're not seen as people. And we, we, need to, we need to recognize that they're people. And a lot of times, get this, a lot of times they're innocent. <laughs> How about that? You know, a lot of times they were literally in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or a lot of times they were born into terrible circumstances and don't have many choices. And so we need to recognize that there are people who have been wronged and we need to listen to their voices. That's what I would like to see. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, um, you know, even out here, now that's in the institution. Now, even out here, for some odd reason, the government or the or the world still can't find it within themselves that change is possible. Even in programs out here, when it comes to who, the, where's the target population, gang involved, you know, formerly incarcerated men and women, it's minimal funding that you get. They just still can't see that these people can literally change their lives. And so even as program uh, coordinators out here, like the Homeboy Art Academy, when it comes to gang, gang involvement populations, we're seeing minimal support from even the county or even you know the city as, a, as large. Now they're trying to turn the dial, but I mean, the dial has been turning for many, for decades and we're still not there yet. So I just wanted to paint that picture too, because not only are they being punished within the institution, but it just seems like the punishment continues even out here. And, and it has been, even for myself, I've been finding, I find myself in dead ends as if I'm not capable or because of classism and all these other criterias 
it excludes me continuously. So I have to keep pushing. And that's just the, that's just what happens, you know, and I think we're, that's what we're working towards as well. Not only inside, but bettering the outside as well, or else we're just setting them up to return back to the institutions if we mm. have nothing for them. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, as we speak about uh, whether it's re-entry, and then we put the re, the rehabilitation. So I asked somebody, when was I habilitated? And what that looked like? At what time in my life, if I'm gonna be rehabilitated or given ability, hobble means to give ability. So when was I made able? At what point in my social experience, especially here in America, you know, when was that time? So uh, something I like to say, what we don't recognize is that law enforcement runs reentry. Not only does law enforcement runs almost 99 point, I'm talking about religion, uh, whatever's going on in a prison, because safety and security is the guise which controls everything. When you come into re-entry, and I was fortunate to work with the mayor's office with the director of re-entry, and they said, well, Tobias, we really don't run re-entry. Law enforcement runs re-entry. So uh, once you understand that the funding is being ran by or controlled by law enforcement agencies, why would they put themselves out of business? You know, no, people have been living good off of me being in prison to the point that it's been a sore eye upon uh, California. Uh, now we are now changing that no juvenile, but now where are these juveniles going? You know, uh, we talked about trauma. We didn't talk about, we spoke on trauma. Trauma just doesn't leave. It doesn't, doesn't dissipate. You know, you have to bring about positive experiences on deep and emotional and social and spiritual and psychological and ancestral levels to deal with some of the basic traumatic experiences that young people have gone through, going through that rite of passage in prison. You're talking about we have been done wrong by law enforcement. We have done wrong by attorneys. We've been wrong by DAs, judges, a correctional staff. Then we have a very difficult time while we're in there. I'm talking about me, myself. Come on, I graduated from high school. I was sheltered all times of my life. And I know I left out traumatized. So not alone, young men and women who have no parents. I will say this, 90% of the men uh, that I've dealt with, young men and older men, was never hugged and said I was loved by their fathers. I was the first one to hug them, the first one to love. This was in the 90s. It was such a, a poignant fact that the governor himself, Governor Brown, when he wrote my commutation, he put it in my commutation papers, 4,000 men. So think about 4,000 men or young people who's incarcerated that had an alienated relationship with their father or no father at all, has never been hugged and said that I love you. These are the kind of real realities that we're dealing with. And uh, you know, right now dealing with all that we're dealing with in society, these young people are coming back to the streets and the adults are coming back to the streets and we have to have something viable. I say this, I just went to the parole office he had one man there with one leg. Somebody dropped him off at the parole office. The, uh, the, the officer came out and said, what are you doing here? They said, it's not their responsibility to house me. So they dropped me off here. I sent a young Hispanic man with a, 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 a shopping cart full of clothes and stuff. He's, I seen a white brother out here. All these men are homeless coming out of the prison system. You know, so these are things, these are real realities uh, that we're facing right now. And it's like the pushback with arts programs. So it's, and you guys say this so beautifully, like the power of art to tell your story. And when someone knows your story, it's really hard to dehumanize you. It's true. And it's like, and that's like the power and the necessity of having these arts programs, like within the walls and outside. And, you know, as, well, there's so much I would love to continue talking about. I also like find that sort of that intersection between art and religion also very interesting. And, you know, it's like, and, feel, and I remember you all mentioning something about also religion and expression of religion is also something that's, is it curtailed? Mm. Or are there outlets for expressing faith? Uh, no, uh, it's, 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 I'll say this very quickly. It's certain things you don't want to be, especially in the 90s. 
Uh, you didn't want to be black. You didn't want to be Muslim. You didn't want to be young. You didn't want to be a leader. Those are four things that I was in prison when I went in. I was a young black male who was called a super predator. I was a Muslim in which, you know, they, they wrote me on my as an urban terrorist before 9-11. And then I was a leader. I was a leader by force. They forced my hand in leadership. But when we say religion, it just actually means to realign. So we don't see art, religion, spirituality, and ancestry as separate things, but as one whole unit. And this is how I taught and experienced that, that our ancestry speaks to our spirituality. It didn't matter what religion that you was in. So it was Muslims, Christians, Catholics, Jews, uh, brothers who's in the Hindu faith, all of us, I'm talking about from the county jail 1991 before the reforms, all the way to our left, all of us would come together in one spirit, the spirit that drives all of it. And we found various art forms to express that spirit. And so yeah. that's how I've always- no, uh, You can see that. that in Fabian's art as well. Yes. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Mm. Oh, yeah. Are you, I mean, <laughs> you got me off guard. Being told no, by no, being, time I, I is think, up. I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the important thing to do is, uh, one is when I do hold space for the individuals, I introduce them to various teachings that have been handed down to me. I try not to, I, I first thing I say, I'm not, I'm not here to impose anything on you. These are other various practices. And if you find yourself in them, roll with it. It's not to take you away from Catholicism or any other type of religion. But the goal here is just to create such space where their voices can be heard. And if it is through the uh, indigenous Native American drum, then so be it. If it's through the African drum, then so be it. And if it's about weaving such thing as sweetgrass and prayer, then so be it, you know? And, and, and then, but it's intentional. And that's where the tickets at, being intentional about how we deliver and bring forth these practices. And then they themselves, will identify and reconnect in their own spiritual way, which then builds upon their resiliency. Because we can't forget, we we are resilient people right. from day one. And how do we bring in an antidotes or any practices that's only going to help to cope, to, to nurture and build on that resiliency, right? And that's that's the idea. And through these various traditional arts practices, there their voices will be heard and then they will be, there they will feel their growth. And that's the intentionality. There's something I wanted to share that came from Bhavan and my relationship that I had to access to Cal State University, my immediate release. And so uh, there was a program designed for us to correspond with the students. And so to bring a real live body out of incarcerated space inside of school space, thus the prisoner becomes a professor because he turns over the class to me. So how do you think that made me feel as an individual who never felt accepted in school to get out of prison after 30 years and to be teaching on a college level, holding seminars with his colleagues? Their minds were blown. The next thing that came into play, the students wanted to be more active in connecting with the incarcerated artists, with the incarcerated student. So everywhere that I go, I've spoken at USC, I've spoken to UCLA, the court Cal State University. We have found students right now, my little sister Kat, she's here right now from USC, uh, supporting a, a web and being an activist and giving the weight of her being a student in some of the most prestigious universities and saying that we're gonna do a better job and we're gonna leverage our status and privilege to help men and women who find themselves incarcerated. And we're going to use education, literature, and arts to do so. I believe that is very powerful. And that is a simple way that we can put pressure on uh, those that do control the levers of change and power and that uh, these students ain't going to go for it, even if you don't want to listen to Tobias Fabian. <laughs> Thanks. Just, great. <laughs> great model for like university. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. That's so much already has been offered for food, for thought, and there's clearly so much room to grow. Um, if, if people haven't yet submitted Q&As, um, I would encourage you guys to do so, but we're not getting to Q&A quite yet. Um, first, I would like to invite Tobias to set up his uh, little stage. 
And um, I'm very, very proud to present a spoken word performance by Tobias entitled, When I'm President. Wow. First of all, I ask all of you to take a moment to just stop and breathe. The reason why I said that is because it's been a common notion I've heard, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So before I can go into some kind of creativity or some kind of spoken word, I must say Brianna Taylor, I must say her name. I must speak on the boyfriend that gets up and shoots a shot in the protection of his household and calls his mama and then calls the police saying someone is come outside of my home. So these are the things that are running through my mind, George Floyd. Ask the officer to take him outside of the car because he feels claustrophobic. Give me five minutes, officer. Officer, give me five minutes. And that five minutes turned to moments in which his life was taken and he called out to his mother because he could not breathe. We're in the middle of COVID, social injustice. But we have seen to forget that five black men was just lynched 90 days ago. Hmm. So before I tell you when I am president, or when I take the precedent, first of all, I want to remind you, five black men were hanging from trees. A few were in California where they said they hung themselves with no ladders, no chairs. Then after the second one and the third one, so we take a deep breath. We breathe. Many of you know my story. So when I'm president or when I take the precedent, we're gonna honor all life. All life must be honored. This is very simple approach. Very a simple approach. We all come from a seed. And within that seed, when it was broken up, there is life and there's a tree that has more what? Fruit and more juice and more seeds. We all come from seeds. But yet and still, I can't breathe. So when I become president, or the precedent, 77 year old white males will not be the authority since the museum is calling on other museums to share authority. So I'm asking myself in this voting season, when has 77 year old white men became the authority? And there's no other voices to be heard? When Mr. Trump proudly said, I've spent 1 billion on the presidency, but yet and still, Meager funds are being given to the arts. Meager funds are being given for housing. Meager funds have been given to the, the least of us. But yet and still billions are being spent for either two. And at the end of the day, I can't breathe. So when I become president or when I become the president, and I think that's what we need to think about here. What is the precedent? And what is this president is going to bring any different than the 44 or some presidents that came before? So maybe we need to question the system itself. Has it ever worked 
for indigenous people. Ask the Mexicans or Hispanic brothers and sisters who own California, ask them. Ask our Chinese brothers who they tried to work. Ask our European brothers who was getting eaten by mosquitoes and died of malaria because they couldn't meet them South Carolina uh, fields. Ask the hundreds of thousands of millions of Africans that were brought here against their will by ordinance of the church. Ask them, is there any of the voices to be heard? By the way, I was just in South Carolina the other day. I was walking with my mother. And as we was walking, she says, son, around the corner, there's a noose hanging. I said, mama, I know around that corner, there ain't no noose. She says, son, I'm not gonna pay them people no attention. I said, mama, I need to go see this. So we walked around the corner. This was just two weeks ago. I was in South Carolina. And the people had all their Halloween uh, madness hanging around. And they had a black man hanging from a tree. Yes. Wow. I went to a place called Calhoun County. President Calhoun is his name. His family started Clemson, South Carolina. My daddy was one of the first blacks to graduate from Clemson, South Carolina. And right in Calhoun County, I went straight into a Confederate flag, an old one, next to Mr. Trump's flag. Oh, dear Americans, dear artists, dear creatives, those of you who have enough heart to love and eyes to see and ears to hear, it's not going to be right until we make it right. We cannot continuously to beg. We cannot continuously to stand by and allow 77 year old white men to be the precedent in our lives. There are other voices to be heard. There are other lives to be considered. So as I close here, I don't have to be the president to be the precedent in my community. I don't have to be the president to be the precedent in my life, in my family, in my community, in my city, in my state, because I know what I gotta do. It's a shame that a ex-criminal, a parolee, it's challenging you to love, challenging you to hug, challenging you to smile, challenging you to eat correctly, challenging you to engage the arts, challenging you to love on the students that are in your community, challenging you to do something for the poor, the sick, and the need. So as I close, thanking Fowler Museum. I look at the word museum and it means a seat of the muses. Once again, just real quickly, I'm a pedagogue. Critical pedagogy is my thing. I look at the word museum and it says, a seat for the muses. Oh, that's another story. Talk to you on part three. Beautiful. Really powerful. And I invite all of our panelists to turn on their videos and I just, your words are so powerful, so true. And if we're not summoning that level of passion and truth in our classrooms and our galleries and our museums, then we're failing. Mm -hmm. So we have quite a number of, so many questions. You've inspired, all of the panelists have inspired so many people. And it's kind of blowing up in terms of questions. So um, first of all, there's a question about COVID and has COVID impacted the continuation of your programs at this moment? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> yes, it's been a nightmare. It really, it. we already, um, Again, I work in juvenile detention, so it's really such a struggle already just to get the cooperation of the PO, just to get the right hand talking to the left hand and communication happening, to get you know the kids organized in the spaces. Once COVID hit, 
I mean, and, and bringing materials into the facility is also a problem as um, Fabian was talking about like pencils, pens, paints, anything could be used as a weapon. Anything could represent a gang. When COVID hit, <laughs> we couldn't get into the facilities. They don't have Wi-Fi. Like everyone else went virtual. I, I work for other organizations you know, I teach in schools, community centers, like they have the ability to go virtual. These kids, those kids have um, cell phones, they have Instagram accounts, they have Zoom, and I can connect with them. Those that are incarcerated, they don't have any access to the outside world already as it is. But during COVID, it, it was, it, it's been almost impossible. It's been very difficult. We've had to have sessions over the phone what? It's 2020. We've had to have sessions. How am I supposed to teach music and dance over the phone? You know, it just doesn't make sense to me that there can't be Wi-Fi. We, we can't put a router on, on those grounds. You guys have all this money, all these resources. Um, it's been a very big struggle to continue accessing people behind bars during the age of COVID. You know, we can't have any contact the rooms, the spaces that they have are so small as it is. So staying six feet apart, that's not an option. Um, it's difficult to get them outdoors because they're always trying to keep them contained, trying to be able to keep a close watch on them. So sometimes people are not trusted to be outdoors. It has been a, an enormous struggle. Mm -hmm. Yes, to answer your question, COVID, the pandemic has put a, an enormous strain on our connection to incarcerated populations. Mm. And going back to that seat of muses and lining up part three, we have a lot of questions about museums. For example, one individual asks, how can museums and universities be good or better partners to support the good work that you do? Or there's also the question, are they not good partners? partners in the first place and who would be better partners and that opens up a big conversation um, I think um, I, I think for me personally to be honest with you and, and let's be honestly um, I don't think that the museums are no longer the driver for us to even to like to foresee something in that right and I think the new generations of today I haven't been able to utilize any like 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 any museum as a driver this is where you can go if you put your practice, it doesn't really, it's not part of the landscape due to so much dissolution, due to so much discouragement and the lack of inclusivity. And so why would I sell to my participating youth and formerly incarcerate something that might not really exist and be there for us? So I'd rather just build on the access that we do have because we do have access now to digital platforms, cameras and everything that is more tangible now as it, as it wasn't then. And so, maybe we can get to a place now where the museums can actually uh, take a risk and loosen up the grips on the criteria and, and the labeling that comes from museums on what is art and what isn't art. Once we begin to take that risk, then maybe the interest of us creating that pathway into a museum can rekindle itself. But for now, I've been comfortable enough not to uh, sell something that might not be of existence. And so that's my take on that. And I, I believe Tobias wanted to check. Yeah, I'm going to say this before maybe Roy speaks on, on a more professional uh, level. Uh, this is something that me and Fabian is going to work on. Uh, there's no disrespect to all the beautiful museums out there, but, uh, you know, we're going to create our own museum. Now, and if any of y'all want to get in and help participate, support, uh, fund uh, museums in our own community that we totally uh, uh, control and dictate uh, what happens inside of that space, then that's more what I'm with and what me and Fabian, we call the uh, the right left hand punch uh, is going to start working towards. Uh, we're going to put it in our communities. And if you want to see us, we need you to come in our communities. We uh, not going to yours, but I think uh, Bazan should say something concerning the connection between universities and, uh, and our programs and institutions. Well, um, certainly as far as universities, the, the on, on a kind of low level as a faculty member, as Tobias has indicated, getting students involved through, um, even though I don't like the term very much, community engagement projects where you have academic learning that takes place through dialogue where you recognize um, 
incarcerated artists and writers as as people with knowledge that can share that knowledge with your students that that can be one way but i think like beyond that there's a bigger question that universities and and um museums need to ask themselves i mean if you look at the history of a lot of museums um for example i went to did my PhD at the university of london and the british museum very famous museum but everything in there came from colonialism and looting the rest of the world. Mm. And it's controlled by a certain class of people. Um, and there needs to be a lot more reflection upon what those institutions do and not a kind of tokenism of just allowing people to come to speak for one thing, but actually sharing power in a meaningful way. And that means also sharing resources and trusting people to, to make their own programs with those resources, not, necessarily controlled by a professor like me, like real partnerships. Yeah. And, and adding to what you just said, uh, uh, Biran, um, is that uh, it should be always a two-way street, mutual relationship. So as the faculty from your museum or your school comes to engage within our communities, it should also be very flexible for us to come into that community because what happens most of the time is that they come into our communities and try to understand how Fabian redirected his life. They write an amazing thesis <laughs> and Fabian takes the back seat and mm -hmm. they go great accredited. Mm -hmm. And then Fabian is not a, accredited. And so that, dem that, that demolishes us, that dem And so how do they, if we are writing thesis on community-based organizations, as well as for me, incarcerated men and women, not only should we write the thesis on them, but accredit them for they're giving us a knowledge for us to become credited. Well, so that's when we then begin to coexist. And then together we can make the world a safer place. Right. That's, the, that's the ticket to me. And that's the fight that I keep pushing for. Yeah, and just to say one last thing, I hear the same thing from students. And this is really, it is a wake up call to museums to rethink what those partnerships and what those collaborations really look like. And just one really quick question and then we're off. There's a lot of questions from students about how they could get involved in your organizations. Where's the best place to go? Is it your websites? Yes, homeboyindustries.org. I'll, I'll write it in the chat. I'll write it in the chat. Well, thank you all so much, Tobias. That performance was so incredibly moving. And I know it's a little weird to perform to a camera, but I've been getting texts and there are a bunch of submissions in the Q&A reiterating how powerful it was. So thank you, thank you so much for offering that to us in this space. Um, and thank you so much, Fabian, Vedan, Jahana, for sharing your energy with us today and the important work that you're doing and the impact that it makes. Amy and I are so honored to learn from you all. And we certainly expect that this is just the beginning of the Fowler Supportive Incarcerated Arts Programs. Thank you to everyone who joined us. This program has been recorded. It will be available on our Instagram and on the Fowler website. We certainly hope that you'll share it, especially in these days leading up to the election. We hope that you'll join us again soon. You can find details about our next program on the closing slide. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you again next time. Thank right. you, everyone. Love you, Kat. Thanks for showing up. Peace. Peace. All right, y'all.